North Carolina, 2018. I was dog sitting for my mother's dog named Jack, and he wasn't an ideal dog to take care of. He was a mutt, and his pit bull blood could make him aggressive, especially with other dogs. My mother lives out in the country, and she has two acres for him to run around. This is great because it helps him get out some of his energy. And out there, he doesn't bother anyone because beyond her property is just woods. I let him outside around 10 o'clock at night one night, and right off the bat, he ran into the woods behind the house. Didn't even pause a second. I figured that would be the last time I saw him that night because it's not unusual for him to take off like that and stay away for a while. He pretty much always comes back on his own after roaming in the woods for a bit. Anyway, it was about an hour later and I was laying in bed trying to fall asleep when I heard dog noises and what sounded like claws scrabbling against the bedroom window. Jack had apparently made his way back home for the night, but obviously dogs and certainly Jack don't normally scratch at the window to come in, so that was my first indication that something was off. I got up and looked out the window, but all I saw was Jack standing by a tree about 30 feet from the bedroom window. How did he scratch the window and then get over by the tree so fast? Certainly, that's not normal dog behavior at all. And he was just standing there looking straight at the back door of the house, not barking or moving at all. He was stiff like a statue. I opened the window and called out his name, and he turned his head towards me a bit, but didn't move any closer or bark at all. It was almost like he was in a trance or something. So anyway, I knew there was no way I could fall asleep with him being home, but not inside. Not to mention that he was acting so skittish and weird. So I put on my shoes and walked outside. As soon as he heard me open the door, his fur stood up straight. He didn't bark at me or move an inch, just continued to stand by that tree in that weird, trance-like state. I began to walk toward him, and as soon as he saw me do that, his fur stood up even higher. Normally, Jack would run over to me with his tail wagging like crazy, but not this time. He just stood there like a dog who was possessed until I got to within about 10 feet of him. Then I heard it. The noise was somewhere between a dog barking and a person screaming, but it was perfectly clear that it wasn't coming from Jack. I turned around slowly and looked back towards my mother's bedroom window that I had just looked out earlier. The window was in the opposite corner of her house from where I was now standing. And there, standing right at the window, but just out of eyesight, if you were inside, was a huge dog-like creature that had its back to my mom's bedroom. It had fur all over its body and had dog features like a snout and pointy ears, but it stood on two legs like a man. I could see large, muscular arms, and at the end of them I could see what looked like paws. And at the end of the paws were long claws that looked like they could rip anything apart in seconds. It was looking at me with these hyper-aware, amber-colored eyes that were shining in the moonlight and I could see its mouth perfectly. It had lips that were pulled back in a snarl which showed off two rows of teeth that looked like they could also tear up anything they wanted. I swear I could even feel its breath blast right through my body as it continued to stare at and snarl at me. However, at the same time I noticed that it was breathing extremely fast, like how a dog would pant if they were afraid or stressed or maybe hurt. I could see its fur was standing straight up and the smell of fear was almost palpable. I don't know if it was my fear or Jack's fear or even the creature's fear, but I do know that the feeling of panic filled the air around us. I was feeling pretty sure that the creature was going to attack me or Jack and maybe even devour us right on the spot. But before it could do anything, Jack turned and ran over to it with his mouth snarling and tail straight as can be. Jack had obviously snapped out of it and was now not scared of the creature at all. I'm sure that thing must have been really confused because he probably had never met a dog like Jack before. He probably thought that Jack would be scared of him, but Jack ran right up to it now and began snarling back at him from about two feet away. The creature just stood there for a minute, with its mouth open in what I honestly thought looked like amazement. As they stood there in their standoff, Jack began to circle around it, and they ended up with the creature cornered near my mom's bedroom window. And then, before anything else could happen, it turned and ran off into the woods with Jack close behind. I couldn't see them once they were in the woods, but I could hear noises like a dog that was being hurt. 
I now started to really think that the thing might have been hurt, because why else would it be seemingly afraid of us and run away? Then again, I've also been reading up on them, and I'm learning that they don't really want to hurt us. They just want to assert their dominance and let us know that they are there and that we need to be careful not to encroach on their space. Anyway, it's now been a few days since Jack took on the creature and he's been home and not going outside much. He is acting strange though, like I hear him whimpering in a way I've never heard before, and sometimes he's even been getting on his hind legs to look out the window and howling. Normally he would attack anything and have no problems doing it. I mean, he always patrols the yard when people are outside and he has never been afraid of anything. I think that the creature really did something to Jack, or did something to his brain to mess him up in some way. He's never acted like this before, and I think we will be keeping a close eye on him and my mom's yard. She's expected to get back home from her business trip today, and I'm sure she'll be relieved to see Jack is okay. I did tell her all about it, and I'm not sure what she thinks. It was hard to tell over the phone, but I'll know better when I see her face to face. I don't know if that thing will ever come back. I hope not because it really scared me and has me on edge too. But at the same time, now that I've had some time to think about it all, I'm kind of curious what that thing is all about. I mean, I'd like to learn more about what it could be. I think it was a half man, half dog person, like a mutation, but I don't know. What do you think? Hello Lilith, before I begin this narrative, I would like to express that I'm a huge fan of your channel, which has proven to be an invaluable source of comfort based on what happened to me. Today I'd like to share a rather extraordinary encounter I had during a hiking expedition with a creature that I think was a rake. Just about a month ago now, my friends and I planned a hiking trip. As someone who's often the more cautious and less adventurous one, I initially tried to discourage them. Despite my reservations, their enthusiasm was unwavering, and I eventually decided to join them. After all, I thought it might be a refreshing change to step out of my routine and immerse myself in the great outdoors, a practice that doesn't come naturally to me. To help you follow the story, I'll tell you about my friends and give you a brief description of each. Firstly, there's Frank, a regular guy with brown hair, decently tall, a bit on the pale side, but definitely the life of the party. Then there's Bob, who's taller, sports a full beard, and naturally assumes the role of our group's leader. Finally, there's Laura, who is perhaps the most grounded and practical among us. Prior to this, my experiences with hiking were few and far between. I recall going on a couple of such outings in my younger years, both of which ended in accidents, including a near arm break and a close call with a concussion. That's why this hike was almost like starting from scratch for me. I made sure to get myself sturdy boots and plenty of trail mix and coffee. Bob drove us to our destination, a park located in Louisiana that had been discovered online by Laura. She was the one who planned the whole trip after Bob initiated the idea. On the journey, Frank entertained us. He entertained us in the car with his eccentric singing and an unusual smell that was oddly reminiscent of rubber. We were all in agreement on that. Despite the oddities, we were also grateful for his role as the snack provider, as he'd brought large bags of chips and an assortment of drinks. Upon arrival to the park, we settled into a small, rented cabin that was basic but clean and tidy. Before starting our evening hike, which they all insisted we do first, we had a brief break and just relaxed a bit. Bob and Frank were engrossed in a passionate discussion about football, while I tuned in to something on the TV and Laura lost herself in a book. When it was time to start, I was nudged awake from having fallen asleep on the couch and we headed out. I won't lie in saying I grumbled a bit at having to do a night hike first. Frank was guiding us and identified a promising path that he thought would be easy in the darkness. So we started out by following him. Meanwhile, Bob was interjecting random witticisms and even breaking into sporadic, stupid dances. I'm sure we looked like a bunch of idiots trying to look cool in the forest. But for the most part, it was a fairly normal hike until just about an hour into it. That's when we began our return journey. That's when our normality was somewhat shattered. 
While making our way downhill, Laura mentioned she had caught a glimpse of something unusual. I assumed it was perhaps a deer or some other common woodland creature. But after we all looked around and found nothing, I reassured her it was probably just a deer or perhaps even a squirrel. She seemed convinced it wasn't a squirrel, but accepted that it could have been a deer darting around behind the trees of the forest. As we continued, she again claimed to see something. This time I made some stupid comment like, yes, we are in the wild. It's natural to encounter wildlife. Despite her persistence in saying that what she spotted was not just a regular animal, I felt she was probably overreacting. However, she then approached Bob about it, who assured her he'd keep an eye out for any strange creatures, although his primary concern was getting back to our cabin. Frank, in his typical laid-back fashion, remained uninvolved, happily crunching on his snacks. Unbelievably, he had his earphones on and was therefore oblivious to Laura's claims. In an unexpected twist, Laura's insistence on spotting something strange was vindicated when Bob, in a very whispered exclamation, drew our attention to a truly horrific sight. We all stopped and looked at something that shook each one of us to our core. There, at the edge of the light from our headlamps, was a grotesque and hideous creature resembling a pallid human or a hairless wolf or hyena. It was intently crouched low to the ground and feasting raw on what appeared to be a deer. The sight was so ghastly, I had to look away immediately. Bob hushed us all with a frantic wave of his hands and told us to maintain silence and quicken our pace without running. That was a given as we were naturally inclined to want to get out of there. Frank turned off his music when he saw Bob waving his hands and Laura managed to mouth a smug, I told you so. But all we wanted was to reach the safety of our cabin. Fortunately, the creature was at a safe distance, and we don't think it even noticed us. I realize that seems amazing, but it was really intent on its kill. Luckily, our cabin was not far at this point. Though we were not in immediate danger, the encounter was undoubtedly terrifying. Back at the cabin, speculation ran wild amongst us about the creature's identity but we were unanimous in our decision to cut our trip short and return home. None of us were against that decision, and as soon as day broke, we were out of there. On our way home, I began researching potential explanations for the creature and concluded that it could have been the rake, a cryptid I hadn't heard of before. All I had ever heard of were the more mainstream mythical creatures such as Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, or the Kraken. Once home, I spoke to my father about our experience. Based on my description, he suggested it might have been the rake or possibly a rabid animal that had lost its fur. He was leaning towards the latter and I think just humoring me by agreeing with my assessment of it being a rake. In a later group call, we all rehashed the day's unforgettable events. I shared my unsurprising resolution to take a permanent hiatus from hiking, as this was my third awful experience in the outdoors, and for me, this was three strikes and you're out. Everyone understood my stance. And with that, Lilith, that is my terrifying encounter with the cryptid that I believe was the rake. I hope my tale adds some interest to your channel, and I look forward to hearing other people's experiences with these cryptids. Thank you for your time. I had just bought a nice chunk of land out in North Dakota for deer hunting. There was a little off-grid cabin on one corner of the property, but that was all there was, in terms of modern amenities. Most of the land was open prairies, but there was a pond and a couple of sparse forested areas near the back. It was my first year hunting in this exact area, so I didn't know it very well. But I could see that the pond was a highly trafficked water source, and so I started setting up stands near the trails that were going in and out. The price of land out here was already typically lower than average, but I had gotten this place exceptionally cheap. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but after what happened, I certainly know why now. It was opening weekend and I had everything ready to go. The land was around a five hour drive from my house and I had spent the last three weekends out there, setting up stands and fixing things around the house. It felt isolated up there, but I guess that's because it is. Rolling hills disappeared into the horizon. No forests, no mountains, no civilization, just the prairie. 
My brother met me at the cabin for opening weekend and our luck started out great. I got a deer Saturday morning in the stand above the pond and he got one Sunday just before dawn as we were walking out to our spots. Everything was as it should be. On the second night, my brother had to go out to his car for something. I can't remember what it was, but when he came back in, he mentioned that it was kind of creepy outside, different than before, like the whole atmosphere changed. It was just something he said in passing and didn't discuss it any further, but he was right. Something about the land changed when the sun went down. I didn't know what exactly was going on, but it felt foreboding in a way that I couldn't explain. I didn't want to sound like a wimp, but I didn't like going outside at night there either. I never had a problem with the dark before, but this was somehow different. My brother had to leave on Sunday evening and head back home for work on Monday. I had taken the entire week off to stay at the cabin. I had another deer tag and I figured I would try to use it. Watching my brother's truck disappear down the road made me realize just how uncomfortable I was with the isolation in this place. It was getting dark, so I went back inside the cabin and locked the door. I got a phone call from my brother about 20 minutes after he left. Cell service wasn't the greatest in the area, so I could only make out about every second word he said. He said he saw something on the road and that he couldn't turn around. I think he was trying to get back to the cabin, but said he couldn't. He said something about eyes, but I couldn't make it out, but I did hear the last part. He told me to lock the door and stay inside until morning. I tried to call him back about a dozen times, but I couldn't get through. I was panicking, thinking something happened to him on the road. I started packing up my things and loading them into the car. I would be able to get decent cell service in the next town or at the very least find him along the road. My brother's warning made me pretty worried, but I had to get a hold of him and find out what happened. I locked up the cabin and headed towards my car. But just as I opened the door, I heard my brother calling my name. I looked in every direction, but I couldn't see him anywhere. The driveway was empty. I told him I couldn't see him and to flash his headlights, but I received no answer. A moment passed and he called my name again. He asked what I wanted for dinner. And then he said a few other things that I recognized from the last conversation we had out on the prairie. My stomach dropped. It was like someone had recorded us and was playing it back to me. I shined my flashlight around the driveway and the cabin, but I couldn't see anyone. I was now getting frantic. I grabbed my rifle out of my car and loaded it. Not the best state of mind to be carrying a gun, but what else was I going to do? I knew this wasn't just some silly prank. Whatever was harassing me out there was evil. I was sure of it. I heard my name again. It was definitely my brother's voice, but I knew it wasn't him. I thought it was some sort of demon, and I hoped to God that bullets worked on demons, because if I got a sight on it, I was ready to shoot. But the wind was covering up any noises as I tried to look and see the long, rustling grass around the driveway. I slowly spun in a circle, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever it was. Eventually, a creature that defied all logic stepped out of the grasses and onto the gravel of the driveway. I turned on my flashlight and pointed the beam of light in the direction of the noise. Immediately, two glowing eyes lit up in the darkness, reflecting the light back at me, just like a cat does when you catch it sneaking around at night. This startled me completely, but I had to keep looking. I couldn't break my stare. This thing had a human-like appearance, but there was something very off about it. Its arms and legs were way too long for its body. They were thin and twig-like, almost as if they were made from stretched out pieces of taffy. Its skin was a dull gray color, completely devoid of any hair, making it look even stranger. My mind was buzzing, trying to make sense of this bizarre sight. The creature was hunkered down close to the ground, right by the edge of the tall grass that was blowing in the wind. Its body seemed built for standing up straight, like a human or a bear, but for reasons I couldn't understand it chose not to. And there it was, right in front of me. Instead of moving or running away, it just sat there, staring at me from its spot on the ground. I could feel its gaze intense and unwavering as it watched me, waiting to see what I would do next. What the hell are you? I asked. I didn't expect an answer. I was just talking to myself and thinking out loud. It responded to my voice by turning and looking at me. It then curled its lips and screamed. 
It sounded inhuman. I don't even know how to describe it. I took a shot at it, but was shaking so badly that I don't know if I even hit it. Whatever happened, though, it was enough to scare the creature away and allow me to get into my car and get the hell out of there. I drove like a bat out of hell towards the next town and found my brother at the gas station. He had also found it as the first place of refuge away from the cabin. He had still been trying desperately to get through to me on the phone from there. I told him what happened after his call. I told him all about how I had tried to leave to help him and that this insane creature showed up and tried to stop me. He told me all about how he had seen them too and that's what he was warning me about. He said he had seen dozens of them all over the road as he drove away and they blocked his path so he couldn't return to me. Needless to say, we only went back to the cabin one more time and that was to get all of our things in the daylight. I can't tell you how much it helps me that I have him to talk to about this. It seems that no one else wants to believe what they haven't seen themselves. Anyway, I hope our story can help someone else out there who's feeling alone. We're here for anyone who needs us. When I was a very young man, I got a summer job working out in the cornfields. It was very hard work, but honest work pays well, and it was decent enough money to help me save up for a car of my own. I had been bumming rides from my friend and even my parents, offering what money I had for gas, just trying to get around. And I got sick of it. I had been used to helping my dad do mechanic work out in the garage when I was younger. And because I would usually try and devote as much time as I could to help him, he would pay me for it extra what I was already making in my allowance, which helped. And that lasted until I was around 14 or 15 when I just kind of lost interest. And at the time being, I was giving as much money as I can in gas. But that's beside the point. As I stared up at the ball of fire in the sky each day, that was my focus. A new car. My own set of wheels. I didn't have to go super expensive, but I wasn't going to do a $600 beater. Unless you grew up in the Midwest like me, you've really got no real idea just how big those cornfields are and how darn tall some of that stuff can get. When the job had started, there were only a few of us out there each day, and all of the hours were very long. The fields were vast. We'd meet up for lunch breaks just to hear another voice or two. But as the weeks progressed on and on, the work dwindled, and soon I was the only sucker left out there. I'm telling you, nothing makes you feel more isolated than being in a cornfield. Out there, you can feel very alone. I took to telling myself stories just to get through those long days of total solitude. But what I saw that very last afternoon, sure as hell, wasn't no fake ghost story. And I swear this on my mama's grave. There were all sorts of critters trying to get to that corn. I'd seen woodchucks, deer, raccoons, but never in my wild dreams had I seen the likes of this thing before. In fact, something like this I thought only existed in the movies. But I guess I was wrong. Maybe these are just wild animals that live in certain regions of the country. I don't know. It was coming up towards the end of the day and it had been very hot. Especially if you know anything about the state of Indiana. The first thing I recall was that it seemed to have gotten really quiet all of a sudden. It's like somebody took the master volume of everything around me, nature included, and pulled it way down to zero. All I could hear was the corn swing in the wind, but barely that. No bugs, no birds, no twittering, nothing. Zip. Zilch. I remember standing there for a moment, wondering what on earth can make everything go quiet. The silence was deafening so much so that it caught my attention and made me stop. I didn't feel right. Something just felt off. A couple of times I'd seen an eagle fly over and man, those creatures made a lot of noise trying to scare them off and warn each other. But I ain't ever heard silence before like this. Walking a bit further into the highest corn, I saw why. This thing was standing with its back to me at first. I didn't know what it was, but my mind told me I needed to get out of there, and now, only my legs wouldn't obey. It's like I was being pulled towards this thing, whatever it was, or whoever it was. Real slowly, it turned around, and I got a very good look at it. Now, here's what happened next. 
I know you're probably not going to believe me because it probably seems so make-believe, but it's the God-honest truth. What I saw was real tall, like eight feet or so, covered in dark black hair, matted all over its body. Its legs were like that of a dog, and that's what it resembled. It even had the hawks. But its feet were like massive paws spread out. This thing had really long, stretched, lengthy arms, like a human, but more dangly like a chimpanzee, how its arms go far past its waist. But worst of all, the head was like a wolf, a real mean-looking wolf staring down at me like I had just disturbed it, and it wasn't happy to see me. The most intense and fiercest-looking eyes. This thing opened its mouth, and oh god, the teeth! They were more like giant fangs, with sharp little bladed teeth throughout its mouth. I don't know if this is a wolf or what, but as far as I knew, wolves didn't have teeth like this. It was like every tooth was serrated and razor sharp. I didn't hang around any longer. I didn't want to find out what he intended to do with that mouth. I turned and I ran and I ran all the way back to my father's truck. And I never stepped foot in those fields ever again after that. Even though it was my last day, I had to tell my boss that I had a medical emergency, and I just never called him back. Yeah, I know no shows are no good, but I can't tell you what that was like. Again, I never stepped foot into those fields ever again. Screw the car and screw the money, it wasn't worth it. When I first started telling this story, I'd begin by listing my military rank and my qualifications. I'd go out of my way to look credible, but it didn't help. No one wants to believe what's hard to believe. Eventually, I stopped putting my identity at risk. I stopped offering up those details that might get me in trouble. I started jumping straight to the point. The point is, I've seen a monster. I was stationed on an aircraft carrier at the time. We were passing through the Mediterranean, briefly anchored to perform a routine operation. Very quickly, things unraveled. We were joined on deck by unfamiliar personnel. They had the kind of clearance that demands you stop asking questions. We were at least confident that they were military. They carried themselves like military. Even our superiors made room for them when they passed by. Step aside, salute, and mind your business. But they brought instruments out from below the ship that none of us had seen before. Barometers, photometers. I'm not sure why. One device was particularly unique and particularly eye-catching. It looked like an old-school transceiver, the kind soldiers would strap to their backs in Vietnam, but it was interacting with the other instruments in some way. Whatever science they were performing, it was beyond the understanding of the rest of us. We kept our noses down and focused on the tasks we were assigned. The longer we worked, the further night stretched on, the more we realized that what we were doing was menial tasks. They were keeping us preoccupied. When we realized that, we started focusing a little less on the job in front of us and more on our surroundings. Why did they want us distracted? What questions were they worried we'd ask? Then the ship lurched and everyone on deck became as frantic as buzzing bees. Something rocked the vessel, hit it from below hit hard enough to make the ship sway on the surface like a rocking chair. The scientists were yelling, sweat on their brow. The rest of us split into two groups, one to assess any damage below deck and another to search the water. I stayed above deck and peered over the edge of the ship. We hit the spotlights and still couldn't see much. There was too much distortion on the surface. The ripples that moved across the water each time the ship swayed made it impossible to see very far below. But no one saw any damage, not from the outside or from below deck. Whatever hit us wasn't a weapon, we guessed. Although that made it stranger. Was it something living down there that had knocked against our underside? We didn't know of any creatures big enough to cause the commotion we'd felt. Already we were speculating out loud. The scientists were having none of it. They shouted some commands across the deck and we were ordered back to our basic tasks. A few of us looked around in disbelief, palms open as if to ask our superiors, what gives? What's actually going on is what we wanted to ask. But we got an answer soon enough. As we looked across the deck of the ship, eyeing the scientists on the other side, we watched as a great dark pillar climbed out of the ocean. 
Water dripped from the black column as it passed the edge of the ship and then climbed well above our heads. Everyone turned to watch it rise. Then another sprouted beside it. Then another climbed from behind us on the opposite side of our vessel. Soon, there were four great pillars all around us. We stared, drifting somewhere between terror and awe. Slowly, someone worked up the courage to point one of our spotlights at the columns, and we realized they were limbs. Brown, glistening skin, round, sucking discs, each one larger than our heads. Rows of barbs the size of railroad spikes lined the sides of each tendril. What we were looking at didn't make sense. Not only was the massive structure surrounding us alive, but we vaguely recognized the limbs. Tentacles. We didn't want to think about how large that would make the creature below us in the water. A weapon discharged somewhere on the deck. Chaos followed. The limbs thrashed overhead, rocking the ship for a second time. We all scrambled to take cover, expecting the pillars to come crashing down upon us. We were bracing ourselves for the water. Our ship couldn't take the kind of damage this thing was about to deliver. I glanced back at the scientists. They were punching something into their device. Then, inexplicably, all of us got dizzy. We swayed on our feet, and it wasn't due to the choppy water. Most of us fell to our hands and knees. A lot of us vomited where we stood. Even the scientists buckled. But as we all collapsed, so too did the giant limbs of the lurking beasts. They retreated pulling far away from our vessel before beginning to sink. They disappeared beneath the surface. Those of us who regained our composure the quickest tried to track its retreat, but it was gone. A stunned silence followed. The scientists packed up their belongings and retreated below deck before any of us could corner them with questions. We were instructed to leave them alone, barricaded in their quarters. Had that machine of theirs summoned that insane creature? We wondered, was it also the reason we all got sick? The military has a way of making you recognize the futility of your questions. We realized very quickly, after some loud convincing, that the answers we were looking for weren't that important. Not if they put us at risk. But that didn't stop us from casting worried glances from time to time. That didn't stop us from checking the water for signs of an attack. We were changed after that. There was no getting around it. And I guess because of that change, I started telling the story. There was one question I couldn't give up on. What was that thing? I'm a third generation cop. My dad and grandfather were city cops, and they always told me that you have to like two things when you join the police, walking and driving. I like driving, I always have. And I like the open spaces more than I like big cities. So the California Highway Patrol was a perfect fit for me. There's a lot of scenery during the day on 395 outside Bishop, but at night, there's a whole lot of nothing. Just your headlights and the road and empty sky and the shadows of scrub and cactus and the occasional snake or coyote on the road. Normally, I like desert country, but it's not the kind of place you want to have car trouble. Of course, that can and does happen. I've seen a lot of stuff happen in my 15 years on the force, Everything from the aftermath of a 20-car pileup, an old-fashioned bank robbery, and yes, getting a cat out of a tree. Well, it was actually getting a puppy out of a drain pipe, but the point stands. And that point is, there are some things that nothing prepares you for. Like that one night on Route 395. As a highway patrol officer, I spent a lot of my time patrolling for drivers that had the bad luck to have their car overheat or a tire blow. It happens more often than you think, and there are plenty of people who have no idea how to change a tire. So when I do have to stop, I'm used to lending a helping hand. That's what I was doing one evening in July. I was on my regular patrol when dispatch called to say there was a stranded motorist somewhere south of Fish Springs, down by the reservoir. I was already headed south on the 395 at that point, so I radioed that I was on the way. Dispatch advised that a tow truck had been called, but that they had a two-hour delay and the motorist was pregnant. When I pulled up behind the car, I couldn't see any obvious problems with it. It was just pulled up on the side of the road. I made sure my spotlight was on the driver for a second so I could see how and where she was. Once I did, I popped open my door and walked over to the car. 
The driver was definitely pregnant, but she told me she wasn't hurt and that she wasn't close enough to term to have to worry about delivering. I was trained to handle it if she'd gone into labor, but I was glad it wasn't going to be an issue. I asked her if she had an updated ETA on the tow truck. She didn't, and asked if she'd like me to inspect her car to see if I could figure out what the problem was. She gave me permission to check under the hood. As I walked around to the front of the car, I could smell something odd. It smelled sweet, like an odd candy. A quick sweep of my flashlight around the engine showed the kind of problem I couldn't help much with. Her radiator was definitely overheating, which might not have been so bad, but that sweet smell was stronger than ever, and that meant a coolant leak. I told the lady that I was sorry, but she would definitely need that tow truck since it was a radiator problem. She wasn't happy about it, but since she wasn't alone out in the desert anymore, she was ready to wait. It was a hot night, and the heat from the day made the ground still feel warm, and I bellied out to see if I could spot any leaks from the undercarriage. I saw one almost immediately. This wasn't from a loose hose. This was a lot worse. I was pushing myself back up to my feet when I heard something off the road. I froze for a moment to listen. Aside from the pinging of metal as the car cooled off very slowly, I thought I could hear a clicking noise. I checked with the driver, but she was on the phone with the tow company and wasn't looking like she'd heard anything. I radioed dispatch that the motorist wasn't in any immediate danger and that I'd wait with her until the tow truck got to the scene. After I did that, I checked back under the hood again and tapped the coolant hose with my finger to check a theory. The whole thing disintegrated at the touch. I've had that happen to me before, old parts that fragment into plastic bits, and I knew this little red sedan wasn't going anywhere without that tow truck. I closed the hood and let the driver know what I'd found. She told me that the tow truck had gotten free earlier than they thought and was on its way. Good news, right? As I walked back to my cruiser, I heard that clicking sound again. I'd spent a lot of time on this highway and I'd heard a lot of the desert sounds, but this one sounded different. Sounds travels differently out here, but this was a clicking noise I couldn't place. The hair on the back of my neck stood up and my shoulders tightened. Something was off out here and I didn't know what it was. I swept my flashlight out into the desert past the cars. There were no other cars on the road still and I couldn't see anything moving out there. The clicking noise stopped. After a minute, I tried to relax. The woman opened her car door and asked if something was wrong. I didn't want to scare her by telling her I had a bad feeling, but I also didn't want to put her in danger. I asked her if she'd be more comfortable waiting in my patrol vehicle. She looked at me as if she knew something was off, but she didn't ask any questions. I radioed dispatch again, telling the operator that I was moving the motorist to my cruiser for safety. When the operator asked what the safety concern was, I really didn't know what to tell her. I think I said I had a bad feeling, which sounds incredibly unprofessional, but I didn't have anything else to offer. That clicking sound came again. It was closer. I got both of us in the cruiser and hit my lights and sirens, full blast. I let that go on for a full 15 seconds before I cut the sirens and listened again. Nothing. The hot, dry night was dead quiet. After a bit, the regular sounds of the desert came back little skitterings from a lizard. Something flew overhead, the normal nighttime calls. The woman eyed me nervously. She probably thought I was crazy. I apologized, then explained as professionally as I could that I'd thought I'd heard something and that I wasn't willing to risk her and her baby's safety if I was wrong. To keep her calm, I started asking her about the usual pregnancy stuff. Do you know what you're having? When are you due? She calmed down and we had a nice conversation, but all the while I was watching the dark desert beyond the road. I can't remember the last time I'd ever been so happy to see a tow truck pull up and I've been at the scene of some pretty nasty accidents. A big man hopped out of the cab, pulled on a reflective safety vest and walked over to us. Lay got the paperwork sorted out and I told him what I'd seen with the coolant hose. The operator assured us that I got this and went to go hook up Lay's car. He was just about finished connecting the chains when the night went quiet again. The clicking started up in the desert again. This time, there was more of it. 
not just off to the side. It came from ahead of us and behind us. I didn't know what it was, but I did know it had friends. That tow operator gave me a look. I gave him one back. My hand went to my service gun and I keyed my shoulder mic to tell dispatch the car was being towed and that there seemed to be something in the desert. To my absolute shock, the operator got very grim. Get out of there. Fortunately, we could do that. The tow operator, John, according to his name tag, hopped in his truck and I got back to my cruiser. We both got back to the road as fast as we could. As I started following the tow truck, my headlights caught something approaching from the desert. And I say something because to this day, I have no idea what it was I saw. It was low and fast. So fast, all I got was an impression that it was covered in short, pale fur because I couldn't see anything else. At first, I thought it was a coyote. They're fast and about that size, but it wasn't a dog shape. It was, and this sounds nuts even now, more like a person. I've heard of people who went nuts from drugs, but I've never heard of one who went around crawling on all fours in the middle of the desert at midnight. Lay said something from the back seat. I looked in the rearview mirror as I answered, and despite being a 15-year veteran, I felt my blood run cold. There was something following my car. Several small, skittering forms crawling at top speed after me. I hit my lights and hit my siren in a few short bursts, hoping that John would get the message to speed up. Whatever was behind us couldn't keep up, but the thing certainly tried. It's been a few years, and while I've been called out to that stretch of Route 395 since that night, I've never seen those things again. I do still keep in touch with John from Sims towing from time to time, and he tells me that he's heard the clicking noises in the desert every so often but that he hasn't had another encounter since then. I hope that means those things move deeper into the desert and not closer to towns or the campgrounds. Guess I'll just wait and see if any stories come floating up the grapevine. Thanks for listening. I grew up in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina, and I currently live in Utah. I've spent most of my life outdoors, backpacking, hiking, solo trips, climbing, I've always felt at ease and comfortable in the woods. This was probably about five years ago now. It was September, and my boyfriend, my dog Annie, and I took a three-day weekend to the Wind River Range outside of Pinedale, Wyoming. We arrived late at night and spent the night in the back of the truck at the trailhead. The next morning, we hiked 10 miles to camp at Lost Lake. Lost Lake is a very small glacier lake with large rock cliffs and an incredible view of huge, craggy mountains. We set up camp next to the water and had an amazing day. But when night started to fall, things got strange. I had an uneasy feeling in my chest, but I didn't say anything to my boyfriend. The dog kept pacing in circles, but we figured it was just from being in unfamiliar territory. We watched our small fire burn out and went to lay down around nine. I fell asleep right away. I woke up to the dog crying outside the tent. My boyfriend was sitting up in his sleeping bag. I asked if he was okay, and he said he felt strange. I called Annie back in the tent. She was acting so strange. She was shaking like she was scared. I put her between us to warm her up and calm her down. She was just staring into my eyes with the whites of her eyes showing. She's a cattle dog and not usually afraid of anything. So that made me start feeling anxious. My boyfriend said he was cold and had a terrible headache. I gave him some Advil out of the first aid kit and took a look at the time, which was 2 a.m. I thought he was showing signs of altitude sickness and hypothermia, which was weird because we live at about 8,000 feet. We were camping at 10,500 and the temps were in the upper 20s. It didn't make sense to me because it wasn't unusual conditions for us. We were used to that climate and I felt fine. Annie kept looking more alarmed. She stopped breathing like she does when she sees something. Her ears perked up and she stared out the door of the tent. A little while later, my boyfriend said he was burning up. He wanted out of his sleeping bag. I made him stay in his bag thinking it was hypothermia. I told him he would be okay. I got out of the tent to make a hot drink and the dog went wild. She ran out of the tent and stood beside me growling in every direction. I shined my headlamp everywhere, but there was nothing in sight. I told her it was okay, but she wouldn't listen. 
my boyfriend started saying we needed to leave. He got out of the tent and started to pack up our camp. I pleaded with him to calm down. I've never seen him not calm. He is the voice of reason in our relationship. I'm usually the one to overreact, so this was bizarre behavior. He just kept saying, we need to get out of here. It was 2.45 a.m. and we started our 10-mile trek back to the trailhead where our truck was parked. I'm normally in the front when we hike, but that night I stayed in the back keeping my boyfriend in the front and Annie between us. We walked silently for an hour. I've never been afraid of the woods. I've had things happen and I've been afraid of situations but never of the woods. That night I was terrified of the woods and used all my willpower to stay calm. In the middle of our hike, the peaceful ambiance of the forest was broken by the sharp sound of a twig snapping. Annie abruptly came to a standstill, her ears perked up and her eyes alert. Picking up on the canine's cues, my boyfriend switched on his headlamp, its white beam slicing through the darkness to our left. Not too far from us, a shadowy figure was stirring, no more than 30 feet away. With a nervous grip, I directed my flashlight towards the movement, unveiling a sight that sent chills down my spine. The creature was a terrifying sight to behold. Tall and gaunt, its towering stature easily reached seven feet. Its head was a macabre caricature of a deer skull, crowned with an eerie set of antlers. The eyes, glowing a menacing yellow from the empty sockets, were the stuff of nightmares. Its body was a grisly sight, adorned with what appeared to be remnants of decaying flesh, barely clinging to its skeletal frame. Despite the beast's horrifying upper body, it was its legs that truly seemed out of place. Rather than the clawed appendages one would expect of a monstrous creature, they resembled the slender, hoofed legs of a deer. It was a grotesque blending of man and beast, an abomination against nature. It was a ghastly sight, something you'd expect to find lurking in the desolate depths of a grave, not here in the heart of nature. The creature moved with an eerie grace, its yellow eyes surveying the surroundings with an intense scrutiny. We instinctively ducked behind a large boulder, praying that we had not been spotted. All we could do was watch as it held its ghastly head high, its gaze focusing on something in the distance. Without any warning, it took off at a speed that could only be described as superhuman. Its movement was fluid, barely a blur before it disappeared completely from our view. The way it moved was inexplicably unsettling. One moment it was there, the next vanished without a trace. Annie was just shaking and silent. We started to walk quickly, keeping both a light and our eyes behind and ahead of us. We didn't talk at all. At dawn, a bow hunter was running toward us up the trail. I said hello, and he stopped and looked into my eyes. He nodded and said, it will be okay. And that was maybe one of the most bizarre parts of this whole thing. I was exhausted and terrified. His behavior freaked me out even more. We must have looked like we were in bad shape. We got back to the truck around 7.30 a.m. My boyfriend was still not feeling well, and Annie didn't look good either. I drove us four hours home. It took two days for Annie and my boyfriend to feel well again. I don't know what happened to us in the woods that night. I don't feel like what we saw was an animal. It felt like something demonic took hold of us that night. My boyfriend said he had felt like something had taken him over, like he didn't have any control over his thoughts or emotions. He said a voice told him to leave our campsite. He said he would have left with or without me, which is not like his normal self at all. He would never abandon me. I don't know why I didn't get affected with the same level of sickness that he did, but it's a good thing I stayed functional, even though I was petrified with fear. I still haven't been able to talk about this to anyone. I'm glad you're here for me to share this with. August 8th, 1990. I have always loved running. I tried some other sports when I was younger, but by the time I got to middle school, I was only interested in running. I did pretty well on my middle school team, and by eighth grade, I was the fastest girl on our team. I was determined to not only make the high school team, but to be one of the best on the team, even as a ninth grader. So the summer before ninth grade, I trained hard. I sometimes ran with my mom, but I also logged a lot of solo runs that summer. 
One day, early in August, I went out early to run. The sun had just come up, and I wanted to get my run in before the heat of the day. In northwest Pennsylvania, where I grew up, summers weren't usually too hot, but this particular week was a scorcher. I was going for a longer run that morning, so I wanted to make sure I could get done in time to meet friends who were going kayaking on the river. I started out that run listening to music on my Walkman, but it soon went dead, so that didn't last long. It was fine, though, because I liked to listen to sounds around me when I ran anyway. We lived about a mile from the trailhead where I did a lot of my runs. I was really just on autopilot that day, running my usual route and had just gotten on the trail when I started to get a weird feeling. I wasn't scared to run on this trail alone because even though it was somewhat secluded in the woods, it really wasn't far from the surrounding neighborhoods and the highway. I sometimes saw hikers or runners on that path, but usually not early in the morning. So I wasn't sure why I suddenly felt like there was someone else there. I remember slowing down and looking around me and just thinking maybe I should turn around and go back even before I actually saw anything. I was feeling uneasy, and then I heard the scream. It sounded like a person screaming. I stopped dead in my tracks. I remember my heart was pounding as I looked around me. I couldn't tell exactly where the scream was coming from. I wanted to turn back and try to get to the road and home as soon as possible, but what if someone in the woods needed help? So I kept going while looking all around me as I walked. I was no longer able to run as I felt like I couldn't even breathe. Then I saw where the scream was coming from. Someone was standing in the woods, I thought. I could only see a rough outline through the trees, but as I got closer, I heard another scream, and I realized I wasn't looking at a person, even though it sounded like a person screaming. From the back, it looked like some kind of animal, maybe a bear. But it was just standing there on two legs, like a person. I just froze, unable to run away, and waited. Not sure what I was waiting for, but then it turned around until it was almost facing me. That's when I saw the face and realized it wasn't a bear or any creature I had ever seen. It looked like the face of a giant dog, but not a friendly, happy dog. A terrifying dog or maybe a wolf face with hideous teeth and a jutting jaw. I had no idea what I was looking at and realized I needed to get away as soon as possible before he saw me, if he hadn't noticed me already. I remembered learning that you shouldn't run from some animals. Was it bears? Because then they would see you as prey and chase you. But this wasn't a bear. I had no idea what to do, so I turned and ran anyway. I do sometimes wonder how fast I did run as I was literally running for my life. I don't think I'll ever run that fast again and hope I never have a reason to. I thought I could hear it coming behind me, but it was even hard to hear anything over the sound of my heart pounding as I gasped for breath. I ran as fast as I possibly could and felt like I was about to collapse when I got to the road. I was relieved when I saw a car coming on the road and waved my arms frantically. I couldn't believe my luck when my friend John stopped his car and rolled down the window. He asked me what was going on, but I opened the door and jumped in, screaming, drive, go. He started driving and I finally felt like I could breathe. I tried to tell him about what I had just seen but could hardly get the words out. He was so kind asking me if I was hurt, if I needed to go to the ER or home or what I needed. I realized then that he was dressed in his work shirt from the grocery store where he worked. I apologized for making him late but asked him just to take me home please. He did and I ran inside as fast as I could still not able to fully relax until I was inside the house. My dad was home, and I told him all about the incident. He listened both that time and later, when I recounted the entire story to my mom. They were both convinced that if anything, I had probably seen a bear, which had been spotted in the woods around the area. I tried to convince them that what I saw was definitely not a bear. That would be my last solo run on the trails. To this day, when I run, I stick to the road and sidewalks unless I'm with a group. Even then, I still feel the need to look around me constantly and I never feel quite at ease in the woods the way I did before that day. It was several years later when I came across a video on the internet about cryptids that I finally learned about a creature called a dogman. And now I have no doubt that is what I saw that day. For years, it was under our noses. 
that's what really gets under my skin, you know? I hate how close we were to this thing without ever realizing it. Maybe some of our tragedies could have been avoided, but then again, maybe not. My dad and I used to fish at a creek. We started when I was young and continued doing it until he passed. I kept going to the same spot when I needed some advice. Sometimes it felt like he was still there with me. Sometimes I even heard his voice. Other times I knew it was something else with me in that creek. Something dangerous. The first time we saw it, we were together. We didn't know it then, but we probably looked right at the thing. We told my mother about it that night, although we definitely described it all wrong. I'm not sure that I could describe it now, even though I've seen it a half dozen more times. That first time, we cast our lines over the side of the wooden bridge that crossed the flowing water. We liked having something to lean on, set our drinks in, whatever. That was our spot. One time, we heard a loud splashing further up the creek. We thought it was another fisherman or maybe an animal. When we looked, and I know this sounds crazy, we saw a fish jump clear out of the water. I don't mean up and then back in, either. It jumped up and into the trees, disappeared into the forestry, like something had hit a home run on the poor thing. We told ourselves that a bird must have grabbed it. We didn't see a bird. There wasn't one to see. That time, we didn't see anything. I'm not sure why. Maybe we weren't ready to see it. Our second encounter, I think, happened when my dad was alone. I was busy with college, so he came by himself more and more frequently. Maybe he was out there pretending to talk to me. I don't know. The thought makes me feel nice. I got a call from my mother not long after that trip. My dad was sick, ghost white, she said. And when I got home, he was sweating, complaining about the cold and staring wide-eyed out the window. I think now he was just afraid. I think he saw the thing again, saw it for real. Maybe it came after him. He never went back to our spot. I was too busy to drag him myself, and the old man passed a few years later. I didn't return to the creek for a while yet. When I first got back, I'd completely forgotten about the flying fish. I'd forgotten about my dad's white face and where he'd been right before that terror had gripped him. I was just missing him. I wanted to reconnect. I thought the water, the fish, and the peace and quiet would do me a lot of good. I didn't find any peace out there. It was broad daylight. I cast my line over the railing, same as always. Deep into the afternoon, I heard something. A twig broke. Deer were coming through, I thought. The bushes rattled, and I thought for sure I'd see one come trotting up to the water. Nothing showed up. I could see and hear the foliage as it swayed and snapped, reacting to the weight of some animal. But I never saw the animal. Even when the bushes parted and something stepped through the empty space, I didn't see it. I stared, I sweat, and I trembled, but I did not see it. I didn't see it until it crouched by the waterside and dipped its hands into the stream. I saw water run down the shape of human arms. I saw it drip down the lips of a wide, hungry mouth. But I couldn't see its body, its skin. Not really. It was clear. When it moved, it looked like a spot in the world was wrapped in plastic. It shimmered just enough for me to distinguish a translucent humanoid shape. It was something invisible. It was something that didn't want to be seen. I don't know if I gasped or yelped or tripped over my own fishing pole. I only know that I suddenly made a noise and the thing that I couldn't see turned toward me. I saw prints press into the wet earth that disappeared as it walked toward the bridge. I heard something scratching at the wooden structure climbing up from underneath. The invisible thing growled like a mother bear protecting her young. So I ran. I didn't look back. I didn't go back. I ran and I stayed gone. The invisible, shimmering thing must have plucked that fish from the water all those years ago. It must have leaped back into the forest to eat, leaving us scratching our heads. My dad knew it. He learned the truth before I did. He learned that all the time we were fishing, we were squatting in the den of some mysterious beast. I was cold for a while. I was afraid. Then I remembered that my father let this thing chase him away from our spot right under our noses all along, and we didn't have the good sense to chase it away. We just let it spook us. We let it take the place that should have been reserved for my best memories. That was years ago now. I've been searching for my courage, I guess. Maybe I was just waiting for the day that I had nothing to lose. I wouldn't say I'm at that point, not exactly. But I do know it's time. 
I'm going back to that creek, and whatever that thing is, I'm chasing it out of there. I'll root it out from under that bridge if that's where it lives. I'll run it into the woods, and I'll hunt it down if I have to. My father feared this thing until the day that he died. I'm determined not to let it ruin my life, too. This happened a while ago, and it changed my life. It even changed how I view the world, I guess. I've told a few people, and they usually look at me like I'm crazy until I show them the side of my abdomen. Then sometimes you can see them change their minds. It was spring, and people were starting to go back outside again after hibernating for the winter. You know how it is. The snows had gone, and it was starting to warm up outside. I decided to barbecue that night, steak with baked potatoes, and we ate out on the deck. After a long winter, it was great to be able to do that again. It was still getting dark pretty early and it was still colder at night, but I just wanted to stay out as long as possible. I got a cigar and started to smoke out on the deck. I'm not allowed to smoke it in the house. So I'm enjoying being outdoors when I see this incredibly bright and bluish light coming from the woods behind my house. At first, I thought maybe it was a construction crew that they were working on the park that's about a mile away. But I didn't hear anything and it seemed too bright to be coming from a truck or something. Well, I got curious and started to walk into the woods. The woods line up with the backyards of everyone on my street, so I wasn't too far from people as I walked. A mile or so in and to the north, there's a park. To the south is a pond. And to the west is a nature center. They've had construction there before, especially around the park. It was around 7.30 p.m., so it was late to be working, but not too late that they might be setting something up for the next day. The light turned off after about 15 minutes. I stood there and thought about going back home, but soon the light came back on again. This time, it seemed brighter and whiter. So I kept walking. I started to feel odd, though. As I was getting closer, it felt like ants were crawling all over my body. So I rubbed my jeans thinking I'd be knocking them off, and it worked for a bit. But the feeling kept coming back, and eventually, it hit my arms as well. I'd rub my arms, then my legs, and kept walking. Eventually, the feeling went away. As I got closer, the light just seemed to be getting brighter and brighter. I thought maybe they were powerful fog lights or something, but then it got so bright that it just didn't seem right. The light was definitely coming from near the park, and I felt like if I just walked over the small hill in front of me, I'd be able to see what was going on. When I got near the top of the hill, though, something inside of me started to panic. I felt really strange, and it felt like my legs wouldn't move anymore. That's when it happened. This force or column of air, I can't explain it really well. Something hit me in my side, and it felt like a million needles stabbing me and burning me. I yelled, and then whatever had a hold of me let me go, and I dropped to the ground. I remember rolling around in the grass. It felt as if I was somehow on fire and I had to put the flames out. That's how hot it felt. It was so intense and it hurt so badly that I guess I passed out for a few minutes. I'm not really sure though. I remember laying on the grass and opening my eyes and then staring up at the sky and trees around me. Then something flashed above me just for a second, but it burned my eyes to look at it. I couldn't see anything for a few minutes, but eventually my eye adjusted back to the darkness of the woods. I got up, and I was dizzy and a little sick, but I managed to walk back up the hill. I get to the other side, and there's nothing there. No machinery, no lights, no sign of anything happening. I didn't believe it. I looked around and saw nothing but an empty park. I walked back through the woods and went home. Eventually, the dizziness and nausea went away. When I break through the tree line, though, back into my backyard, I see a mess of cops waiting for me, and they're standing there with my wife. I don't know what the heck is going on now. It turns out that apparently I had been gone for three hours. My wife couldn't find me and didn't know what else to do. She had come outside and couldn't find me anywhere, and so she called the police. The police asked me a bunch of questions, and I didn't really know how to answer them. How do you explain yourself after seeing what I saw? It was the side of my torso that gave me away. My wife goes to hug me and I cringe from pain. That's when I noticed that my clothes were fine. No marks on them at all. Nothing was burned or messed up in any way. 
We go inside to the kitchen and my wife lifts my shirt to see what's the matter. That's when she backed up and put her hand over her mouth. It was like a checker pattern on my body. The lines were white and the checkered parts were red and burnt all over the side of my abdomen. From my armpit all the way down to the very top of my hip, just one side. I felt like an idiot telling the police I have no idea how it got there. I literally felt like I was lying to them. So I broke down and that's when I just let out the whole story. I told them everything. While I told it, my wife applied a burn cream we had for sunburns and gently applied it to my side. The police seemed to write everything down, but they kept shooting looks at each other. I don't know what happened to me. The burns healed mostly, but there's still a slight scar in the pattern of the burns. You can see it in good light. We moved a few months after. My wife said she just couldn't stay in that house anymore. I can't say that I blame her. And I'm actually happy that she wanted out of there too. This encounter happened on a warm summer evening, July 10, 2023 the date forever etched into my memory. My family and I were in the midst of our annual camping trip to the Florida Everglades, a place we always considered a sanctuary from the rest of the world. We had spent that day exploring the wilderness, and as evening fell, we gathered around the campfire for a nice, warm meal. We were all starving after our day out in the sun. After the meal, I took on the task of washing up the dishes. In the silence, it felt meditative very different from having to wash the dishes back at home. As I was rinsing the last of the pots, a strange rustling from the dense brush caught my attention. It sounded larger, more purposeful than the usual small critters we'd often hear. There, standing awkwardly upright, was a creature that did not match anything in my memory bank. What made my heart sink, however, were its facial features. The creature's snout was elongated, filled with an arsenal of deadly teeth that glinted under the moonlight. But it was the creature's eyes that paralyzed me. My mind screamed at me to run, to flee from this horror, but my body refused to respond. It was as if I had been turned into stone. My gaze locked onto its face. Suddenly, the creature shifted, its long tail slicing through the air. This broke the spell of fear that held me captive. With newfound desperation, I dropped the pot I had been cleaning as my hands were now trembling. I turned and ran back towards the campsite, my heart hammering in my chest as if trying to break free. I burst into the clearing where we had set up camp, my parents and siblings looking at me with confusion. Out of breath and trembling, I recounted the horrifying encounter. My parents initially looked skeptical, but the fear in my eyes was undeniable. The following day, we reported the incident to the local authorities. They listened intently, but their expressions didn't escape my notice. I wondered if they knew something or had been through this before. That haunting encounter has forever tarnished our sacred family tradition. And I'm talking about no matter where we go, the outdoors is just not the same. Now, every rustle in the forest, every shadow in the corner of my eyes brings me back to those terrifying moments. The serene refuge we once found in the wilderness has been replaced by a lurking fear, a chilling reminder of how easily and quickly life can change. Our tradition held firm for years, the wilderness offering a serene refuge away from the hustle and bustle of the city. Little did I know, this tradition was about to be marred by a horrifying experience. It was enormous, towering over me at an intimidating eight feet tall, its body was reminiscent of an alligator or crocodile, but its upright stature was eerily human and it seemed to be using its front legs like hands. In fact, I never once saw it use them to walk. They were a fierce yellow piercing through the darkness and locking onto me with an intense, almost intelligent stare. There was a distinct sense of evil coming from it, an evil that radiated from the creature. They couldn't calm me down, no matter what they did or said. So we decided to leave. Or maybe I should say that thankfully they decided to believe me, and so we packed up and left. Peering into the gloom, my breath hitched as I saw something unimaginable emerge from the undergrowth. There, standing awkwardly upright, was a creature that did not match anything in my memory bank. It was enormous, towering over me at an intimidating eight feet tall. 
Its body was reminiscent of an alligator or crocodile, but its upright stature was eerily human and it seemed to be using its front legs, like hands. In fact, I never once saw it use them to walk. What made my heart sink, however, were its facial features. The creature's snout was elongated, filled with an arsenal of deadly teeth that glinted under the moonlight. But it was the creature's eyes that paralyzed me. They were a fierce yellow, piercing through the darkness and locking onto me with an intense, almost intelligent stare. There was a distinct sense of evil coming from it, an evil that radiated from the creature. My mind screamed at me to run, to flee from this horror, but my body refused to respond. It was as if I had been turned into stone. My gaze locked onto its face. Suddenly, the creature shifted, its long tail slicing through the air. This broke the spell of fear that held me captive. With newfound desperation, I dropped the pot I had been cleaning as my hands were now trembling. I turned and ran back towards the campsite my heart hammering in my chest as if trying to break free. I burst into the clearing where we had set up camp, my parents and siblings looking at me with confusion. Out of breath and trembling, I recounted the horrifying encounter. My parents initially looked skeptical, but the fear in my eyes was undeniable. They couldn't calm me down no matter what they did or said, so we decided to leave. Or maybe I should say that thankfully they decided to believe me, and so we packed up and left. The following day, we reported the incident to the local authorities. They listened intently, but their expressions didn't escape my notice. I wondered if they knew something or had been through this before. That haunting encounter has forever tarnished our sacred family tradition. And I'm talking about no matter where we go, the outdoors is just not the same. Now every rustle in the forest, every shadow in the corner of my eyes brings me back to those terrifying moments. The serene refugee we once found in the wilderness has been replaced by a lurking fear, a chilling reminder of how easily and quickly life can change. I have been ordered not to share this story since it involves law enforcement and also because nobody would ever believe it so I know I'm butchering my credibility by not telling you where I'm from or where this took place. But that's okay. I feel like the exposure of this story is more important than anything else, so I'm okay with keeping things anonymous. I was off duty and driving through a residential neighborhood, because why not? I was divorced and my kids are grown, so I was just passing some time. And as we all know, things happen in broad daylight in places that could easily be right next door. I was driving through a suburban neighborhood with a rounded dead end, and no sooner had I turned past this one house when I heard screaming. I mentally patted myself on the back for deciding to turn through there, and I got out and charged the door with my service pistol drawn. I knocked on the front door and yelled that the police were on the premises. The house had no answer. This bothered me. Things don't just go from zero to 100 and then right back to zero. I then noticed that the door was unlocked, so I stuck my head in, and again, I yelled, Police! Again, no answer. So I announced that I was entering the house and did a full sweep of the lower level, all the while calling out warning signs to any perpetrators. The ground level was empty. I went up the first flight of stairs, and I instantly noticed a swath of blood all along the carpet that led from one bedroom to another. I picked a direction and followed. My choice brought me to where things had started. A bedroom where there were apparent bullet holes in the wall with blood splattering. So somebody had landed their rounds. And a bed that was not only bathed in blood, but it was shredded up in ways that shouldn't have been possible. I sized it up as somebody that had fired shots in self-defense. But their attacker wasn't stopped, and I wondered if they had a machete or something because the level of violence displayed on this bed was ridiculous. This wasn't just a war. This was a massacre. Something heinous had happened. So I continued to follow the trail of blood in the opposite direction. It led to a very strange oddity, a closed-up doorway and stairwell that went to the basement down below. I wouldn't have found it on the ground floor. It was accessible only from the basement and from the second story where I was now standing. I had never heard of a house having this or ever seen any sort of construction like this before. But I digress. 
Someone had obviously recently broken through it, and I could see the blood trail going down the carpeted steps, down into the basement where the lights were off. Okay, this is beginning to feel like I was in some sort of sci-fi movie or horror show, so I gripped my gun tightly and slowly made my descent. I steeled myself and proceeded to the basement, changing my tactics to being quiet and not calling out. Anybody that makes this big of a mess had to have been very dangerous, so I didn't want to take my chances. Of course, what are the chances that this would all happen when I was off duty and I just got to be a part of it? The basement looked to be mostly a man cave, and down there I saw signs of another struggle when I flicked on the lights. Well, they didn't stay on very long. I heard a flick from somewhere else and they went off. I tried the same light switch and the lights came back on. And again, they went off. What happened next was so fast that to this day, I still doubt my own memory. It was too bizarre, too strange. I flicked the lights on for the third time and charged my way into the basement as silently as possible, keeping my weapon ready and drawn. I wanted to catch where the sound of the other switch was coming from and I found it. I homed in on it. I produced my tactical light and told whoever was in the cone of light to freeze. Clutching a bloody and mutilated body was, simply, a monster straight out of the nightmares of any person. It was a wolf with long legs and long arms and blood-matted fur all around its face. But this wasn't just a wolf. It was standing upright, like that of a man. It even had the body and length of a man and the chest and arms and shoulders. This was basically a bodybuilder covered in thick, mad fur with the extremely large head of a wolf. It stood so tall that the ceiling forced it to hunch over. I emptied my entire magazine into the thing. It dropped the body it was holding and almost danced around the room, swatting at the bullets like they were flies. Even though I knew I hit this thing, somehow I lost sight of it in the darkness, and it escaped the cone of light from my tactical light. I had no idea where it had gone, but it was totally gone. I did a double check of the room. Every nook and cranny were checked and covered, but I never saw any trace of it or where it could have gone. I even checked back upstairs, even though it would have been impossible to get up there without me knowing. But I never found it. I had the coroner show up, and they took the bodies away. The thing had killed four people inside the house and was taking them down to the basement. I waited for the story to drop in the news, but it never did. When I asked about it, I was told that I should keep my mouth shut if I wanted to keep my job and not be persecuted, among other heinous things. I'm sorry, but I have to tell somebody. The case was kept very, very quiet. And in fact, even the family wasn't told that it was an unknown creature that did the killing. It was very unusual. I believe the higher-ups knew something that I didn't, because when I tried to explain to them what I saw, I was quickly dismissed and threatened not the least of which was that I would lose my job. So, here I am, and that's my story. This next story is one to really think about. I'm not sure if this person is truly experiencing this or if they're having issues. Listen and let me know what you think. Here it goes. I'm being followed. Something has attached itself to me. The creepiest feeling has been my constant companion regardless of where I decide to lay my head. It doesn't matter where I am. This uncanny presence seems relentless. I hear footfalls echoing in the silence of my apartment every night, as if someone or something is on an endless nocturnal stroll. Oftentimes, these footsteps are accompanied by maniacal laughter, but when I peek my head out to take a look, there's nothing there. I've talked to my neighbors about this, and they say they haven't heard anything. One incident in particular really freaked me out. Picture this. I was all alone, engrossed in some mundane kitchen chores, and a bottle of hot sauce set safely away from the counter's edge. Barely a few steps away, with my back turned to the kitchen, I was startled by a thunderous noise. Swiveling around, I discovered the hot sauce bottle upright, in the middle of the floor, with hot sauce splattered haphazardly around it even in the trash bin, as if it was intentionally squirted in there. Needless to say, I threw the bottle in the trash and took it out to the dumpster immediately. In another instance, I was jolted awake in the dead of night, convinced that an intruder was lurking in my apartment. 
their steps echoing just outside our bedroom. With the bedroom door perpetually ajar for ventilation, these sounds seemed all too real. Yet there was nobody there. When I shook my wife awake, she told me that it was nothing and urged me to go back to sleep. I have never dabbled in anything remotely supernatural like Ouija boards. I've watched enough paranormal shows to know that you should never provoke such entities. I have no idea where this ghostly stalker has come from. What makes it worse is this constant sensation of being observed. It's like I have an invisible gaze fixed upon me. And even more unsettling is that none of my friends or family have been witnesses to these inexplicable incidents. Most importantly, my wife. Oh, and did I mention my left ear? It has this incessant humming, like a sort of white noise that intensifies, then fades away, as if it has its own rhythm. Given all this, I am at a loss about how to proceed. Who do you even call when you're being haunted? As an ordinary person not versed in the supernatural or paranormal, it's disconcerting to be caught up in a scenario like this. This isn't just about some misplaced salsa bottle or nocturnal footsteps anymore. I find myself in a perpetual state of anxiety with a sense of dread creeping in with every unfamiliar noise. This otherworldly stalker has tipped my life beyond its usual balance. I constantly fear the threat to my physical well-being and the psychological distress is beginning to wear me down. My humble abode has turned into an arena for inexplicable events. Left with no other choice, I've immersed myself into an ocean of paranormal research, hoping to find a shred of clarity. Luckily, I live in a big city and have been able to find a ghost hunting group. And let me tell you that friending a bunch of local ghost hunters has been surprisingly helpful. After sifting through volumes of stories, experiences, and theories, a term jumped out at me. Poltergeist activity, a type of disturbance characterized by inexplicable noises and moving objects. Poltergeist phenomena are reportedly caused by spirits, occasionally malicious and often mischievous. Perhaps that's the uninvited guest that follows me wherever I go. Intriguingly, poltergeist activities have often been linked with individuals under stress or emotional turmoil. Could it be that this entity is attracted to my stress levels? I'm losing my sanity. Is this reality or a terrifying nightmare that refuses to end? Is my mind playing tricks on me or am I really being haunted by an invisible force? My ghost hunter friends, my newfound allies in this otherworldly battle assure me I am not crazy. We've taken to regularly burning sage in the apartment. They taught me that this is a cleansing ritual meant to dispel negative energies. We also perform ritualistic chants, our voices rising in a desperate plea to whatever entity haunts me, urging it to depart. I'm basically willing to try anything at this point, and so is my wife. Yet, instead of providing relief, these rituals seem to incite more chaos. It's as if the entity feeds off these attempts and then grows more potent, more powerful, or maybe that's just my interpretation. The footfalls have turned louder, the maniacal laughter more pronounced, the white noise in my left ear has turned into a maddening cacophony of sounds. Instead of being rid of, it's as if we've entertained the entity, empowering it with our feeble attempts at exorcising it. The relentless occurrences have made my life a living horror show. Every night I go to bed, my heart races with the fear of what might happen next. My own apartment, once a haven of comfort and security, is now a vortex of fear and uncertainty. The specter of madness seems to be an increasingly plausible reality, and I feel myself slowly succumbing to it. I know my increasing fear and desperation is making this entity stronger the realization filled me with dread. But it also offered a glimmer of hope. If this entity is feeding off my energy, then I have some degree of control. Maybe I can't banish this entity, but I can certainly starve it. With newfound resolve, I decided to reclaim my life. I needed to regain my mental fortitude to starve this entity of the fear it thrives on. As I began this journey of self-discovery, I realized that I'm not just fighting a ghost. I'm also battling my own fears, anxieties, and insecurities. I'm losing my fight against this entity, 
and with it my grip on reality. I am at war, a war that I am losing against an entity that's invincible, invisible, inscrutable. I find myself on the brink of despair, my spirit broken, my hope extinguished. I fear I may not survive this. The ghost that haunts me might just become my doom, my life consumed by its terrifying presence. Despite the odds, I soldier on, each day a step further into the terrifying unknown. I'm still here, still battling, still clinging on to the last vestiges of my sanity. But for how long? That is something I don't know. I feel kind of silly even writing this or saying it out loud, mainly because none of my family or friends have ever believed my story. So, I'm writing this to you and confiding in you in hopes of finding someone who will believe it. I feel like you might be the type of person who will know if it's the truth, and I hope so. So, here it goes. I love all animals, and I have a house full of cats and dogs. I have fish, and I even have mice. They're all kept very safely, and all mind their own business. I like to think of myself as a very responsible pet owner. Outside, I have chickens. Neither my dogs nor my cats are remotely bothered by these chickens, aside from being a tad noisy now and then, especially if one of the cats is taking a nap. But they never try to get into the chicken run. I don't know if I'm just blessed with well-behaved animals or what, but as odd as it is, and strange as it is, my cats and dogs happen to get along. So when I woke up one morning and found two of my six chickens dead, I was pretty upset. They hadn't just been frightened or killed quickly. These chickens, well, there really wasn't much left of them. It was piles of gore. Of course, everybody was quick to assume that it must have just been a coyote or a fox. But I've never seen foxes or coyotes kill chickens like this. They were ripped to shreds and just a pile of guts was left. That usually doesn't happen in any natural predator. So I buried what was left and fixed a far more secure wire fencing all around the run. Next morning, the same thing. Two more of my remaining six were found mutilated, ripped to pieces. It's almost like something picked them up and just ripped them in half, and then smashed those into pieces and ripped those up into more. That's what it looked like, like something had taken a chicken and shredded it into ribbons. In fact, I couldn't even really discern any specific part of the chicken, like the head, neck, face, nothing. It was just piles of feathers and gore, I was beginning to get really upset, but also I was confused. I couldn't see how a fox or a coyote had gotten into it with a wire grid all along the top. It would have had to lift it off, so that following night I kept watching out the kitchen window into the darkness. So just to make sure I wasn't seen by whatever animal was hurting my girls, the security light was positioned right over the pen. To be perfectly honest with you, I am not entirely sure what I thought I was going to see. I assumed it was maybe a group of coyotes who had found a way to dig under and get these chickens, or maybe it was just an abnormally sized fox. Either way, I wasn't really equipped with any weapons, so if I saw anything appear, my best guess is I would try and scare it away. Turn on the lights and shout. Whatever was going through my mind, I just sat there and drank tea, watching out the window. I was in no way prepared for what I saw, nor could I have ever imagined something like this exists in our realm of reality. I can remember that it was exactly 10.32 p.m. That's important because I was consistently and constantly checking the clock, just so I could see exactly what time this thing was appearing. Although it was already dark outside and quiet, I was by no means sleepy yet. This was not a dream. I was hopped up on tons of caffeine. After probably having my second big glass of tea, I heard my last two remaining chickens start to squawk. Then, all of a sudden, it became deadly silent. I remember thinking, I got it. I was getting ready to bang on the window and scare away the stupid fox, but what I saw that night was nothing at all resembling a fox. This thing was humongous. It was far taller than I, and stood upright, just like a person. Two legs. At first, I even assumed it was a person. The legs were just like that of a man. Knees, calves, thighs, everything. At first, I'm not exactly sure what I was looking at. 
it was covered in hair and not like a fox. This was black as night. I'm not talking smoky or charcoal. I'm talking black. And its face, I'll never forget it. As I've said, I love animals, and I have had a variety of dogs over the years, including Alaska Malamutes, all sorts of dogs. In fact, one of my dogs was an ex-police dog, beautiful but vicious toward strangers. That was what I saw hovering over the chicken coop now, a humongous creature with a very distinct face of what I would call a German shepherd or a wolf, except it was black. Its ears didn't look right, though. Usually, a wolf or German shepherd have perkier, wider ears. This had very tall, pointed ears that were very slender. It was creepy looking, and it looked wrong. The entire thing, all of it, looked off. Like, it wasn't normal. This thing grabbed a chicken and literally ripped it in two, just like somebody grabbing a crumpled up piece of paper and ripping it in half. The amount of gore that shot out was disturbing and made me drop my glass. I'm not afraid to say that I didn't bang on the window or shout. I was frozen in terror, watching this thing just mutilate and annihilate my poor chickens. It wasn't even putting the chickens up to its mouth or eating them. Just killing them. It seemed like it was taking pleasure in ripping them to shreds. In the morning, I told everybody who would listen, but everybody called me crazy. And they told me those kinds of things don't exist and I must have been dreaming due to the stress of losing the chickens. In fact, they even all agreed that I had fallen asleep, and during that time, the fox had gotten in again. They never found it necessary to explain to me, though, how a fox or coyote could get in my pen and do damage like this. In fact, I couldn't even explain it, nor could I explain what I saw that night, nor do I know what it could be. So I'm sending this to you in hopes of maybe some answers. Do you have any idea what I saw and what was killing my chickens? But more importantly, if this is some sort of animal or predator, why didn't it eat them? Why was it taking pleasure in just killing them and leaving them? My friend and I had a big cabin trip set up for her 30th birthday. It was a big deal. Just the two of us. Her husband rented the place for us like a year early. I bought an expensive birthday cake and did all that kind of stuff. Since we lived in different states now, we planned to meet there Friday night at 6 p.m. Dinner and cake and drinks. It was nice to have plans and I looked forward to seeing her. She sent me the address and I popped it in my GPS. Easy. I worked a half day and drove straight from my job. My phone told me it would be about five hours. The drive was easy. Mostly straight roads. Nothing crazy. Because of daylight savings, it got dark early. It was basically dark out by 5.30. I've always been a nervous driver, so I was driving slowly. After a few uneventful hours on the highway, I turned off onto a more scenic road. The trees shaded the narrow road. It was really dark. I turned my brights on so I wouldn't drive off the dang road. I felt like a grandma. I was driving way under the speed limit. I checked my distance to the cabin. The GPS said I was still three hours away. I ignored the nervous energy in my stomach and focused on the road. Slow and steady wins the race, I told myself. I turned on some happy music and kept driving. I pulled into the driveway of the cabin and turned off my car. The eerie silence outside the car creeped me out. The place was pitch black. Definitely looked like nobody was home, but I could tell it was a big, really nice cabin. It stood up on the side of a hill. There were a lot of stairs to the front door. I tried calling my friend, but I had no reception. Of course, I was in the middle of nowhere. I don't think I saw a house for like the last two hours of the drive. Wherever I was, there was nobody around. I left my bags in the car and walked up the stairs to the house. I was almost out of breath by the time I got to the top. The motion sensor lights turned on and almost blinded me. But I saw someone moving inside the house through the window. I knocked on the door and waited. No lights inside came on. I realized I really had to pee. I banged on the door again. If she was playing some kind of joke, I was way too tired from the drive to think it was funny. I walked around and checked the back door. Everything was locked up. Nobody was here. I couldn't hold it so I went down into the grass and did my business behind a tree. 
I was pulling my pants back up when I heard a weird clicking noise. I stood up and listened. I thought my friend might have arrived, but I would have seen headlights. It was totally dark and quiet. I had nothing else to do but wait. I had no plan. I felt like an idiot, and it was getting pretty cold. I got my jacket out of my car and slammed the door. I was feeling upset. I shouldn't be here waiting for my friend. It was her idea to do this dumb trip. I calmed down and went back up to the porch. I froze at the top step. The front door was open. I know that door was closed. I tried the knob like three times. I heard the clicking sound again. I saw something pale move inside the house. I almost screamed and stopped myself. I yelled hello into the house. Nothing. I pushed the door inward and it creaked open. The motion light behind me turned off and it was totally dark again. I heard the clicking. It was in the house for sure. I moved back to make the motion lights come on. The entrance flooded with light. Right in front of me, hunched on the ground, was a person. Or something. It was ghostly pale and looked sick. It was too skinny to be healthy. And the freakiest part is that it was naked. Its head was down. I could see the filthy, slick black hair on its head. I almost asked it if it was okay when it moved. Like a twitch. It crawled sideways on all fours. It was too fast. I felt sick trying to register what I was seeing. The motion lights turned off again. This time, I did scream. I couldn't help it. I moved backward. I was afraid at any moment that thing was going to touch me in the dark. The lights came on again. It was still there. It tilted its head up at me. Its eyes were all pupils like it was insane on drugs or something. There was no nose on its face. If it was a face, I'm not even sure. The mouth was a black hole. I couldn't breathe. I just stared at it. I was locked in place. I have never felt fear like that. When I woke up, my friend was leaning over me. I screamed again, and she stopped smiling. I don't really remember our conversation. I just kept repeating that I wouldn't stay there. She tried to calm me down. She sat me up and said she was going to check out the house. She told me there was nothing to worry about. I watched her go through the front door and turn the lights on. I got to my feet and hurried to my car. I had never felt so irrationally afraid. I got in my car and drove away without looking back. This is the first time I've told anyone about this. My friend and I haven't even talked since. She was that mad, and I don't know how to tell her what I saw. What did I see? I have no idea. Do you? July 12th, 2019 will forever be etched in my memory. A summer's day that started as any other but took a turn I could never have anticipated. I was hiking alone in a nearby park just outside my hometown in Minnesota. My reason for the hike was twofold. On a personal level, I sought to disconnect from the digital world to clear my mind and rejuvenate my spirit. The woods offered an ideal sanctuary for this. On a professional level, I was there to gather content for my nature blog, which had become a passion project of mine. The blog was a platform for sharing my love for nature with others. The day's agenda involved following an unfamiliar trail and observing the behavior of the woodland creatures in their natural habitat. But the day was destined to bring about an encounter that was far beyond what I had anticipated. As I was busily adjusting the focus on my camera, trying to capture the intricate details of a butterfly on a wildflower, I became aware of a stark shift in my surroundings. The change was not in the forest. Rather, it was in my senses. It was as if a sixth sense had kicked in, a primal alertness that couldn't be explained by sight or sound. The first thing that struck me was an overwhelming odor. The smell was a mix of numerous foul odors, the unmistakable stench of stale urine, the sharp aroma of a skunk, and a strong, musty smell that reminded me of forgotten, damp gym lockers. The potency of this scent was overpowering, caught in my throat and prickled at my eyes, making me wince. As I was trying to process the origin of this putrid smell, my ears picked up on an unsettling growl, an ominous sound that was more felt than heard. It was a low rumble, 
like a rolling distant thunder, but with a beastly cadence that shook me to my core. Without any visual cues yet, it was these sensory changes that first made me aware that I was not alone. Stepping cautiously towards the source of the bone-rattling growl, I felt an eerie sense of dread. But my curiosity had always been stronger than my fear, driving me towards the unknown. Rounding a bend in the path, I halted abruptly, my breath hitching in my throat. Towering above me, roughly a stone's throw away, was an entity that defied all my understanding of the natural world. A hulking creature, around nine feet in height, stood there. The dark brown of its body merged into a slightly reddish hue in some places, creating a mesmerizing pattern. Its face had no hair at all and had an uncanny resemblance to an ape, yet the strangely shaped head and stark black eyes gave an alien quality to it. Strangely, it seemed to lack a neck, which further emphasized its broad, hulking body. Suddenly, it emitted a high-pitched yelp that echoed through the forest, punctuating the calmness with the haunting melody of the wild. The sound swiftly morphed into a sequence of rhythmic whooping noises. In that electrifying moment of fear and fascination, my instincts sprang into action. As much as every fiber of my being screamed at me to turn and run, I rooted myself to the spot, trying to maintain calm. I remembered reading that showing fear could incite predatory behavior in animals. I had no weapons or any means to protect myself, except for my knowledge and wits. I knew it was essential to appear non-threatening to avoid provoking the creature. I avoided direct eye contact, knowing that many animals interpret this as a sign of aggression. My eyes darted between the ground and the creature, stealing brief, unobtrusive glimpses of it. As the creature's growls resonated through the stillness, I remembered a tip from a survival guide. It said that making yourself appear larger could potentially deter an attack. Summoning up the courage, I spread out my arms slowly, making myself seem bigger while maintaining a non-aggressive posture. Then, against my racing heart's protests, I started to take small, deliberate steps backwards. The creature and I were locked in this strange dance, both of us assessing each other, a mutual understanding dictating our actions. Every muscle in my body was tensed, ready to sprint at the slightest sign of aggression from the creature. Once I put some distance between us, I broke into a run, not stopping until I reached the relative safety of my car. Panting, my heart pounding against my ribcage, I looked back towards the forest, half expecting to see the creature on my heels. But it was quiet again, as if nothing had ever happened. That encounter was the most terrifying, yet intriguing experience of my life. I'd never heard of anything like this coming up so far north. I always thought it was a southern thing, like a local legend that never wanted to be any further north than the dry heat of Texas. But I saw one on the U.S.-Canada border. I was stationed on a highway checking passports and paperwork for vehicles passing into Canada. Strangely, traffic had been manually dialed back to a trickle. And even stranger still, military vehicles were now passing through. We were cooperating with groups from both the United States and Canadian governments. I wasn't sure what business Canada had with a dozen trucks with concealed cargo, but it wasn't my job to ask. I just checked passports and badges. But then one of the trucks broke down. Something misfired in an engine. There was a loud grinding sound, and then the three vehicles behind it all stopped in their tracks. We were uncharacteristically asked to help them secure a perimeter around the trucks while repairs were provided. Apparently, the men who had already crossed the border couldn't wait. Apparently, their cargo was too precious to endure any sort of delay. I'd be lying if that revelation didn't make me just a little bit curious as to what was going on. Still, I wasn't the one who broke the line. We'd been standing around for more than an hour when one of my peers came to me and asked if I'd heard. He said there are cages inside. Cages inside of the trucks, he meant. There were living things inside of those cages. People? I asked. No, not people. Animals, he said. Already conspiracies were popping up. They were talking about animal testing and unnatural cruelty. Supposedly, whoever had peeked into one of the trucks had seen a monster. 
That made me laugh. But the military personnel were still busy with their parts of the perimeter and with the repairs being done on the truck up front. I laughed, but I also decided to get a look for myself. What types of animals required the security of an entire military convoy? They weren't headed for a zoo, that much was sure. And what could have been in there that another agent would have mistaken it for a monster? Moving on a whim, I broke line and crept toward the nearest tarp. I only had to tug at a single corner. When the flap lifted enough to allow in some light, something began to stir inside. My eyes followed the noise, trying to adjust to the dim interior of the truck. Sure enough, there were cages stacked like crates. Strange mounds of fur and scales were sprawled inside each cage. There were more species than I could count, but only one of them was awake. And only that one let me get a good look at its face. I should have believed the first guy. This really was a monster. The creature looked like a dog in a kennel. Its skin was gray and scarred as if it had been dragged across the pavement. I couldn't see a patch of fur on its body, only the light reflecting on its tightly stretched skin. Its glistening eyes were wet and droopy and bulging from its skull. Even in the dark, it watched me. They were glued to my position the moment I looked inside. It was already growling, warning me not to approach. I couldn't imagine what the dog had undergone to develop a temperament like that. And how did it get those scars? I instantly felt concern and empathy for the caged animal. It showed me that it wasn't a dog at all. The creature opened its long muzzle and I watched its bottom jaw split in two. It opened like normal at first, parting at its lips and jowls. Then the bottom jaw broke in the center with a sickly clicking sound. Each half spread out from side to side. From the center of its exposed throat, A long, tube-like tongue crept forward. It moved almost independently of the creature. To me, it looked like a worm wearing the skin of a dog. I could see sharp barbs at the end of the muscle, and it seemed hungry for whatever flesh it could find. Suddenly, a hand slapped down on my shoulder, and I screamed. I jerked back, lost my balance, and stumbled on all fours away from the truck and the flap of canvas. But before I could say what I'd seen... The man who had grabbed me yanked me to my feet. It was another of my peers, not military. And I was lucky for that. When the military personnel did close in on us and started asking why we'd made such a commotion, my coworker satisfied them with some vague excuse. He said that I had tripped and rolled my ankle. Something like that. I played along and they bought it. Who knows what kind of trouble we would have been in if just one of them caught us looking. And that's when I heard the announcement. The lead truck had been repaired and the convoy was resuming its journey north. We returned to our posts and started up work again as if nothing had changed. I dabbed the cold sweat from my forehead at least a dozen times in the next ten minutes. Then, finally, they were gone. I was safe. That just left the rest of us to wonder what business the military had dragging monsters into Canada. And those who didn't see, didn't believe. But I can tell you this for certain. The creatures in that truck were absolutely the stuff of nightmares. This happened about five years ago, but listening to your channel really made me want to share it now. It happened when a few of my friends and I were on spring break. We decided to set out on a road trip and do something different for a change. We were Florida locals, so we wanted to escape the typical spring break chaos that goes on near where we live. The thought of a nice camping getaway sounded good. We were on our way to the west coast of Florida, but we had gotten a late start. We were cruising through the Ocala National Forest, and we just kind of spontaneously agreed to spend the night there. It was a clear, dry night, so instead of setting up a tent, our driver slept in the van. My other friend and I planned to sleep in our sleeping bags on the ground outside of it. Our main motivation was to make sure we got off to an early start the next morning, without the hassle of packing up a bunch of camping gear. We parked our van about two miles down a dirt road that we had come across. We were on the side of a road, overlooking an area that had a small clearing. Off a little further, there was a dark building with one small light on the roof. We assumed it had something to do with park ranger business. It was pretty late at this point, and us two outside the van were still awake. 
Our friend in the van had already fallen asleep. We were looking down at the clearing when we saw something shadowy at the edge of the trees. We saw someone come out of the woods and start crossing the clearing. At first, we were like, oh look, a person. But whoever it was, was acting strange and moving in an erratic way. They were hunkered down low, and we kind of thought they were trying to sneak up to the building without being seen. But as we watched it get closer to the building's rooftop, the figure seemed to be undergoing some kind of freakish transformation. You might think I was just exhausted and seeing things, but we both saw it. It was looking less and less human every second and starting to look like something otherworldly. Our first assumption that it was just some guy out in the woods was obviously wrong. Then the thing stood upright, and we saw that its height was way taller than any ordinary person. We were in complete disbelief when we saw that its body was covered with a scaly, skin-like material. It looked like lizard skin on a gigantic monster thing, but its head really resembled something more like a dinosaur than a lizard. It completely defied logic. From our vantage point, it seemed like it was over seven feet tall. Obviously, at that point, my friend and I were staring at each other with bug eyes wondering what the hell we had stumbled on. How could something so impossible exist in a national forest? The thing didn't seem to realize we were there. Our van was parked back behind some bushes. But then it got even crazier. As the creature got up next to the building, it let out this bone-chilling shriek. And then, to our obvious horror, there was a response from inside the building. The sound was so high-pitched and sounded like it came from something being tormented. I swear, it pierced through my soul. The shriek was so full of despair, and I started imagining some unspeakable horror taking place inside that building. In that moment, we realized something really unsavory might be going on. Maybe the building was some kind of a facade. It totally felt like the creature's presence and the agonizing response from inside had to be connected to something covert. By this time, we were sweating bullets and just desperately wanted to get out of there. Our minds were racing with all kinds of possibilities. I mean, can you imagine yourself coming upon something like this? It was like a nightmare. We didn't know if that thing would attack us. What if it thought we had something to do with its friend being locked up inside. It was inconceivable to us that this trauma was happening right in front of our eyes in this national park. I guess our fight or flight instincts just finally kicked in. We moved as slowly and silently as we could and managed to open the front passenger door with barely any sound. Once we were locked in the van, we woke up our friend and said we had to get out of there right away. We must have really looked terrified because there weren't even any questions asked. We backed out of there and we were flying down that dirt road like you wouldn't believe. We must have driven for 10 miles before we stopped and explained what we saw. Even though obviously there was no suitable explanation, we didn't know what to do. Were we supposed to report what we saw or something? I mean, we were speculating about everything. Things like government experiments and genetic manipulation or secret projects gone bad. You name it. This next part sounds insane, and I'm pretty sure I wouldn't do it now. But you have to remember, we were only like 19 then. Plus, our driver friend was actually kind of pissed to have missed the whole thing. We didn't exactly have a real plan and were trying to have new experiences. But man, teenagers can be dumb. We were motivated by an overwhelming curiosity and a feeling of disbelief that just wouldn't go away. So we actually made a decision to go back in the daylight and investigate more. The next morning, we went back to that clearing where we had seen the creature, but we were incredibly surprised to see that there was no evidence of anything unusual having happened there. The clearing looked undisturbed and the building with the light on its roof seemed completely normal. We just couldn't believe it. It was a basic building with a few windows and a door, and when we looked in the windows, we didn't see anything suspicious. Although the windows did have bars on them, which seemed a little weird. So, what can I say? The two of us who witnessed everything are totally normal and responsible people. I have no idea what was going on there. But if anybody else has a clue, please fill us in.